I guess we're all set. It's great to see so many people here tonight uh, for the second uh, series. Uh, this year's series is uh, uh, is on uh, celebrating Western Maine history, and uh, we're always going to have something to deal with Western Maine tonight, I'm sure, and uh, mm -hmm. so we'll uh, enjoy that. And it's always a pleasure to introduce the uh, longtime friend of the society, Earl Shuttleworth, who's been over here many years, uh, almost every year for a long time, and it's always great to have him here again. He, as you know, is the longtime uh, director of the Maine Preservation Commission, and also, of course, is the state historian, and uh, so it's always great to have him here. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the program over to him. Uh, Two Centuries of Maine Homes by Earl Shuttleworth. Thank you, Earl. Uh, about six months ago, I finally learned how to use the internet, uh, and this is actually the first uh, PowerPoint presentation that I put together. Uh, as I explain a little bit about the drawings and photographs I'm going to be showing you tonight, to help explain why this was possible. Uh, but uh, PowerPoint being what it is, I still don't fully understand the mysteries of it, so I brought uh, uh, one of my younger staff members, Mike Johnson, allowed me to actually operate the, uh, the equipment. Uh, and, it, and it involves both a projector and a computer. So uh, uh, in any case, uh, I, I think we'll be OK. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a group of primarily old photographs, but there will be a few drawings that come actually directly off uh, the Library of Congress site for what is called the historic American building record. And let me first just share with you a brief description of this very important record of both Maine and America's architectural past. This is from a publication from 1938. The Historic American Building Survey aims at the creation of a permanent graphic record of the existing architectural remains of the early dwellers of this country. The historic value of such a record is self-evident the urgent need for it at present, being 1938, scarcely less so. For aside from the constant toll of fire and decay, the constant environmental changes of our rapidly developing civilization swiftly and inevitably wipe out the records of the past. Throughout the country, scores of significant landmarks are annually destroyed. The survey has no power to actually arrest destruction, but by making full and accurate records, it can make possible material reconstruction for future generations. Now, how did this remarkable record, which now in uh, 2009 actually uh, represents uh, thousands of photographs, measured drawings, and data sheets of buildings, uh, begin? Well, it began out of the Great Depression. One of the first um, Works Project Administration undertakings in 1933 was to put out-of-work architects and engineers uh, to work. And the idea was to have these individuals use their talents to measure historic buildings and make drawings, such as this one, of uh, the German meeting house uh, at Waldenboro, uh, and in addition, to photograph them and to research them. Here in Maine, the effort got underway in January of 1934, when John Calvin Stevens' son, John Howard Stevens, was appointed to head the Historic American Building Survey in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And he, in turn, from 1934 to 1941, uh, had working under him a Portland architect named Josiah Tubby, Jr., who, in turn, hired about 15 out-of-work architects and engineers, primarily in the mid-30s, and the great period in Maine for recording historic Maine buildings, and we'll see them tonight, is 1936 and 1937. Um, in the period between 1933 and 1941, 64 main buildings were uh, recorded in 33 cities and towns. After the war, the project resumed, although in Maine, recordation really didn't begin again until the 1960s. And from the 60s on, uh, there have been a small number of buildings recorded every uh, year or two, primarily ones that are threatened uh, with destruction. 
but uh, you can go to the, to the website, uh, Library of Congress, and find this material. And so we were able to lift these images directly off the website. They have high resolution images, both for the drawings and the photographs, as well as the data sheets, and create this presentation tonight. So I want to share with you first a typical uh, measured drawing done in the 30s. This is the old German church in Waldoboro. It's one of about half a dozen of the surviving, authentic 18th century meeting houses uh, that still stand in Maine today. This drawing was done in 1937. This shows a side view, uh, which gives us the main part of the meeting house and the little uh, entryway at the left. Next slide, please. This is an interesting drawing of the Hanson House in Wyndham, a house that was built in 1803, uh, and it's believed that fairly early on in the 19th century, the famous um, stencil decorator, Moses Eaton, uh, decorated some of the rooms. And again, this is a 1937 drawing, and you can see the extent to which the architect actually rendered not only the wall and the woodwork, but also reproduced very clearly and accurately the stencil decoration, both the border at the top of the leaves and then the wonderful motifs that were on the plaster work. And it's fortunate that this happened because uh, this uh, house was destroyed in 1967. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Now, speaking of destruction, uh, a few of the houses mm -hmm. that were recorded uh, were actually houses that had disappeared many years before the survey, but a record was made through them through old photographs and old drawings. And one of the earliest houses that we have any kind of record of in Maine is the Junkins Garrison House in the Scotland district of York, built about 1707. Those of you who know your Maine history recall that although a permanent settlement began here in the fairly early 17th century, most of those settlements were destroyed in the French and Indian Wars. And what we see here is a photo taken in the late 19th century with this early house being dismantled. Uh, but by because it's being dismantled, we actually can get uh, an idea of its construction, the heavy log construction that was then covered over by clapboards, and a garrison house because it has the, the overhang uh, between the first and second stories. This could be vestigial Elizabethan design. It could also be for fortification as well. Next, please. Right across the street, roughly, from the uh, Junkins garrison, however, miraculously, and even to this day, survives the McIntyre garrison that was built about the same time, about 1707 to 1712. And uh, this house is uh, recorded in the mid-1930s photo. It's still very much this way today. And it has uh, that very distinctive uh, overhang that we associate with the garrison house as well as, of course, the great central chimney. Next, please. And this shows the house from the road and shows how the overhang uh, actually exists on all four sides. This house was restored by the McIntyre Family Association in the early 1900s and is still uh, preserved by them to this day. Next, please. And here's a detail of the uh, ex exposed frame uh, where the great timbers that make up the walls are dovetailed together and notched together at the corner. Next, please. Now, a very early house uh, down at Biddeford Pool that was recorded uh, by the Historic American Building Survey in the 30s is the Haley House. Already by the 30s, as you can see, this house had had considerable alteration. Uh, these larger uh, two over two windows, the Victorian doorway, Many features had been uh, altered in the 19th or early 20th century, but still had its salt box roof form. And next, please. And uh, it had this wonderful, simple, primitive staircase winding up in front of the great central chimney. And next. Uh, but especially, it was recorded for this beautiful wall of paneling in the parlor, uh, which is very early 18th century paneling. Very simple, but lovely raised horizontal panels over the fireplace, vertical panels on either side, an entire wall of panel. Now, uh, another of the great uh, uh, 18th century houses, which had only just been saved 
when the Historic American Building Survey came along was the George Tate House in Stroudwater. This is a house that was built uh, by Tate, who was a mast agent uh, procuring masts for the Royal Navy before the Revolution. And he built this house in 1755. In 1931, it was acquired by the Colonial Dames, who have restored it and have preserved it and made it open to the public each summer ever since. We're seeing it here while it's still in its early stages of restoration, a little rough around the edges. Uh, very uh, uh, distinctive gambrel roof with the recessed windows, kind of like a monitor or recessed gambrel uh, in the front on the third floor. Very simple, very austere on the outside, but next please, but if we go inside, elegant 18th century woodwork, which is all still there to this day. The wonderful curving staircase with the attenuated turned balusters. And next. And this actually is a faux uh, feature. Uh, when the Colonial Dames uh, acquired uh, the Tate House in 1931, uh, they discovered that back in the 19th century, uh, the Anderson family from South Wyndham had bought this beautiful uh, Georgian shell corner cupboard out of the house and, and carted it off to their house in South Wyndham. And so uh, they were able to borrow it and have it replicated. But to this day, the Anderson family hasn't given it up yet. So they still have it. But this is a replica of it. Next, please. Uh, we now move to the Kennebec River and to the Bowman House, uh, built for Jonathan Bowman in 1761. Bowman was a nephew of um, John Hancock. <coughs> and the uh, Hancock family was involved in the development of the Kennebec River Valley before the Revolution with the Kennebec Purchase Company. And they, the Kennebec uh, Company brought uh, law and order to the Kennebec Valley as part of its settlement plan, building the Powellboro Courthouse in 1761 nearby, and then also building for Jonathan Bowman the next year in 1762 this lovely Georgian house, uh, which actually has doorways facing both the land and uh, the, uh, the riverside. Bowman was literally law and order in the Kennebec Valley. He had just recently graduated from Harvard, had a law degree. Uh, he was the judge of probate. Uh, he was the uh, judge of common uh, pleas. Uh, he was the notary public. Uh, he, 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 was, uh, he was all the law in the area. Next, please. Here's a detail of some of the fine woodwork that's found in the Bowman house. And fortunately, this house was, was rescued in the 1950s. Um, two ladies who I knew very well when I was younger, Mildred and Madeline Burridge. They were the daughters of the first state historian, Henry Burridge. And Henry Burridge told his daughters, there are three hot buildings you have to save in Maine. One is the Tate House, and Mildred was involved in saving that in 1931 with the Colonial Dames. Another is the Bowman House. And she and her sister bought the Bowman House to save it in the 1950s, and then found an individual to restore it. And finally, the Palmborough Courthouse, which we'll see later in the program, which she was involved in as well. Next, please. However, not all of these mid-18th century houses uh, did as well as the ones we've just seen. This is the James Kimball House in Kennebunk, a lovely little simple Georgian house with this really wonderful little small scale hip roof, very simple, very restrained. Built in 1763, it was demolished in the year in which the recordation took place. So it's lucky that they got a photo of it. Next, please. And here's the, the Georgian staircase in that house. Next, please. And there's some of the paneling that was in that house. Uh, another great house which was literally altered almost immediately after it was recorded in 1937. We're now in the period after the American Revolution, and this is the Colonel Thomas Cutts house in Saco. Colonel Cutts was one of the most prominent people in the Biddeford Saco area in the 18th century. Uh, he and his wife are portrayed in the great full-length John Brewster portraits that are at the uh, museum in Saco. And he built this great Gamble Roof Georgian House in 1782, 
uh, near Factory Island. Next, please. Here's the elegant doorway, similar to the broken scroll doorways that you find in the great houses around Portsmouth and Kittery, of the, both the pre- and post-revolutionary period. And here's uh, the uh, overmantel in the uh, parlor uh, with the paneling and the great pilasters that grow from floor to ceiling that frame the fireplace and the overmantel. Well, in 1937, this house was radically altered. Uh, the Central Maine Power Company decided to put uh, a power station on the site. The house was moved. It was reduced to a story and a half. And uh, now it's, it's just a, a shadow of itself. Next, please. In the 1790s, the form of houses began to change. They began to move from uh, the Georgian into the Federal. And one of the early houses that was recorded in the 30s uh, of this period reflects that. This is the Benjamin Riggs House in Robin Hood in the Georgetown area below Bath, built in 1797. Simple thick roofed house, central chimney coming out. But the doorway now is more moving toward the federal with the simple fan and the simple pilaster in framement. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Riggses were merchants, uh, and the Historic American Building Survey recorded several of their houses plus their warehouse uh, down in, in Robin Hood. Next, please. And there's a close up of that early federal door from 1797. These buildings are, are still there in Georgetown. Um, Another very important transitional house from the colonial, from the Georgian uh, to the federal, this is the James Means House in Strawwater that spans right across from the Tate House. And in recent years, this house has been acquired by the Tate House and is now the headquarters for the colonial veins in Maine. Um, it's a house that in overall form is very much still looking to the Georgian period with the hip roof. But now we have brick ends with the fireplaces built right in. Um, the doorway is kind of moving out of the Georgian into the federal. And then when we go inside, we see that uh, federal woodwork uh, is now very present. Instead of these raised panel arrangements that we've been seeing running across entire walls that we saw in those 18th century houses, we now have uh, delicate uh, carved and plaster applied woodwork. Uh, that is focused really on fireplaces and doorway enframements. Uh, and this is a particularly elegant uh, federal fireplace uh, from uh, around 1800. This particular design is copied directly from an architectural book of the period, Asher Benjamin's Country Builder's Assistant, published in 1797. Next, please. And here's a beautiful federal doorway surround and uh, the fine uh, carved cornice above it that surrounds the room in the front parlor of the Meetings House in Stroudwater. Now, this was a great loss, and it's fortunate that this house was recorded by the Historic American Building Survey in the 30s. I vaguely remember this house when I was young and growing up in Portland. Remember when it was torn down in 1962, it stood at the corner of Danforth and High Streets in what is now a historic district where it would not be torn down. Uh, this is the Eben Stora House of 1801, and it is almost entirely identical in its style, both interior and exterior, to both the McClellan Houses further up the street, to the uh, U. McClellan House that was part of the Portland Museum of Art, and to the Stephen McClellan House that uh, is the Cumberland Club. And we think that all three of those houses were created by the same architect builder, John Kimball Senior. This one was torn down by the University of Maine Law School, and nothing's ever happened on the lot since. It's just been an empty lot. Next, please. There's the staircase. It had been somewhat modified in the Newell, uh, and it's not as grand a staircase as in the McCollum houses up the street. Next. But there's an in there was an interesting pass-through feature here from the front to the back of the house. There was probably a back stair as well. Uh, one house that still survives, although somewhat modified from these photographs, and one of these, like the house I just showed you, one of these great big federal mansions that was built by the federal merchants or federal sea captains. Uh, this is the Joseph Holt Ingraham House on Lower State Street in 
Portland. Ingraham was a wealthy merchant. He actually laid out State Street around 1800, uh, planted the elms there, created the esplanades, the double rows of trees. This was his house designed by then the young Portland architect, Alexander Paris. Paris was in Portland from about 1801 to 1812. This house still stands, but it's lost a lot of its uh, front detail, including the lovely pilasters on the second and third stories. Uh, and it, it's a house which um, also had lost a lot of its interior woodwork as well. Next, please. Now, this is, this is one of the most unusual of the federal houses in Maine. This is uh, Senator John Holmes' house in the center of the village of Alfred. Still standing today, but uh, rather the worse for wear. Uh, this unique baluster, a, a balustrade with the bow and arrow motif mm -hmm. um, is something which uh, unfortunately is now gone, or at least in storage from the house. And also <coughs> the very attenuated pilasters are very unusual. I have a feeling actually this house may have started out with a simple federal core and then someone got a little ambitious and put this front and side on it, kind of, kind of decorated it. It, it originally dates from around 1802. One of the most beautiful of the federal mansions along the coast of Maine, and one which is still very much intact and beautifully cared for, is the James Cavanaugh House. Uh, James Cavanaugh and Matthew Cottrell were two young Irishmen who came from Ireland to the Newcastle Damascot area just after the American Revolution. They did very well. They both built great houses. Uh, Cavanaugh built in Damascot Mills, Newcastle, uh, and uh, Cottrell uh, built in downtown Damascot. Both houses are still there. This one was designed by Nicholas Codd, who was a local architect builder who had come over from Ireland about the time of Cavanaugh and Cottrell. Next, please. Now, simpler than the federal houses that we've been seeing in places like Portland and in Newcastle, this is the, uh, the field house in Belfast on Primrose Hill. As you get further up the coast, um, things get a, a little more modified. This is 1807, and it's one of a whole group of very handsome federal houses that still survive in the great seaport town of Belfast. Next, please. We're skipping around here, but kind of following our photographs chronologically. Another of these big three-story federal mansions from the uh, period just at the time of the War of 1812. This is the John Parsons House in Kennebunk of 1812, thought to have been built by Thomas Eaton. And you can see, uh, now the doorway is a later Victorian doorway, but the uh, Palladium window is there, the side doorway. And next, please, um, very handsome side doorway uh, with the attenuated pilasters and the little um, arch. And next, and here is beautiful uh, staircase, circular staircase in the center of the house. And then this wonderful little carriage house uh, with the uh, arched openings attached to the back. And now we're, uh, Stan advertised that we have a few Oxford County examples, and yeah. maybe not many, but, a, but some key ones. We're looking here at the Captain Samuel Rawson House on Paris Hill, built in the period of about 1813 to 15. And this is very much in the tradition of the big three-story houses that we've been seeing on the coast. This form of great three-story house in the federal period is much rarer to find inland than it is along the coast. And old brick, as it is affectionately called, on Paris Hill, it is, is really a very rare example of the inland federal house. Um, it's very handsome, the arch federal doorway. Uh, the side uh, entrance, the little foyer, is, was probably added in the Greek revival period, and there isn't really a side doorway there. And the balustrade, uh, again, uh, may be just a little bit later. There's a kind of a Greek key motif in that that may just be a little bit Later. But it's a it's a it's a great house. Next please. Uh, and again, these federal houses continuing. This is the Colonel Jordan House of 1817 uh, uh, in downtown Ellsworth. This is now the Ellsworth Public Library. 
when it was converted to a library in 1897, they put that big colonial revival uh, plotting window on the side. That's not original, but the rest of the house looks pretty much original. Next, please. Um, a house that, when it was photographed in the 1930s, was very much touch and go as to whether it would survive. This is the famous Ruggles House in Columbia Falls, up in Washington County, <coughs> built in 1818, 1819. Um, it's really a masterpiece of federal architecture. The arched doorway, the very delicate uh, portico, the body window above, the, the lovely garlands of art carved over the doorways. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's in an unpainted condition. Uh, it had been neglected for many years. A local lady who was descended from the Ruggles family who built it in 1818-1819 was struggling to put the money together to purchase it and save it. Uh, fortunately, uh, it was saved and was restored uh, after World War II. Uh, this is the remarkable flying staircase. Mm -hmm. These flying staircases are very rare. There, there's one in the McClellan House. In Portland, there's one in the Johnson House in Castine, and here is this very delicate one where there's an engineering system of cantilevering goes up to uh, a landing that breaks, and you have a kind of mezzanine around the, uh, the hallway that feed into the, uh, feeds into the, uh, the, the uh, uh, bedrooms. Next, please. And here, this tour de force of, of delicate carving uh, lavished upon uh, the mantelpiece uh, and the chimney breast. Now the architect and carver for this work is a man named Aaron Sherman, who came from Massachusetts and who worked uh, in the area afterwards in Machias doing houses as well as in Columbia Falls. You can see this house today. It's a historic house museum uh, open to the public. Next, please. We're now back to uh, Belfast and to a simple little federal house, which one could really be very happy with as one's own house, Kimball House, except that it was demolished in the 1960s. Oh. Next, please. And here's one, again, similar in feeling, but a little larger in scale, <coughs> which is still much standing, the Captain Avery House of 1821. These are these very simple but handsome uh, Belfast houses in the federal period. Next. There's the doorway. And here's uh, the lovely winding, delicate staircase with the little carved urns on the newels. Now we're in Ellsworth, and we're back to one of the great federal landmarks along the coast. This is Woodlawn, the Colonel John Black mansion. Uh, Colonel John Black uh, came from England, uh, literally not out of his teens, uh, to represent um, the, uh, uh, some of the great uh, timber interests in London, uh, who had acquired uh, the William Bingham lands in uh, both Hancock and Washington counties. Uh, and he became a major land agent and lumber agent and made a fortune. And in 1824 to 1827, he built this great estate on the outskirts of Ellsworth, which his grandson made it into a historic house museum, and one can still go there today. Next, please. Here is the Beautiful uh, spiral staircase in the center of the Black Mansion. Now we're back in uh, Belfast. And here's a house that started out federal, one of those simple federal Belfast houses of 1812, the Johnson House. And then, much like uh, the house in Alfred, the Senator Holmes' house, uh, they did some remodeling and made it much more elaborate. And when the Greek Revival came along, which is the next period we're about to get into, uh, those ionic columns were put on two sides, not the sides, of course, that don't show from the road, just the sides that show from the road, uh, with this very elaborate cornice. Uh, and so the house was turned from a simple federal house uh, into a Greek temple, sort of. Uh, now, there's only one Victorian house that was recorded by the Historic American Building Survey in the years uh, before the war. And that is the Ruggles Sylvester Morse House, or Victoria Mansion in Portland. And the reason for this was that the house in the 30s was vacant. The Libby family, the second family to own it, had left the house 
1927. They put it on the market. Of course, during the Depression, no one was going to buy what was considered a huge Victorian white elephant. The price finally went down from 20,000 to about 8,000. And in the early 40s, it was about to be purchased and torn down when uh, a retired school teacher and his sister, the Holmeses, came along, saved it. Two years later, the Victoria uh, organization was founded and it was open to the public. But in the 30s, when the Historic American Building Survey was operating, there was a real question whether this house was going to survive. And so even though it was Victoria, and Victoria was not in, this was such an unusual house that a set of photographs and drawings of it were made for fear that it might not survive. Um, 1858 to 1860, Henry Austin of New Haven, the architect, brownstone exterior, Italianate villa, and then next to my interior is, of course, incredibly lavish. This is the uh, reception room or music room on the right as you enter. And you're seeing these uh, photographs, of course, with no furniture because the furniture had all been removed by the family. I'm happy to say today that the house is not only extremely well cared for, but over 90% of the original furnishings are back in the house today. Mm -hmm. Next, please. And there's a view of the uh, front bay window. Uh, again, still very lavish window hangings and other decor on the left there. Uh, as well as one of the, uh, the busts, but otherwise the house was largely empty and uncertain at that time. Next, please. Now we move from houses uh, to what we might class as commercial buildings, loosely, and we're looking here at the Jeffords Tavern in York, originally built in Wells about 1760. It was dismantled by Elizabeth Perkins, who was a very active antiquarian in southern Maine in the early 20th century. She saved this building, re-erected it in uh, York in 1942, and it's now for part of the buildings that you can visit as part of the old York Historical Society. Uh, it was literally a rescue, a simple 18th century building, uh, going to be demolished but saved. And here's an interior view. Um, this is, we're seeing it before it was uh, dismantled. Uh, the, uh, the big uh, uh, cook fireplace in the tavern. Another famous tavern, moving all the way back to Washington County. This is the Burnham Tavern in Machias of 1770. This was rescued as early as 1906 by the Daughters of the American Revolution and has been a house museum ever since. It has the same kind of indented or recessed uh, window in the third floor arrangement as the Tate House. And it was built uh, 15 years later uh, in uh, 1770. Next, please. That's a view of the rear. Um, this was also where some of those who were wounded in the Battle of the Margareta, the first uh, naval engagement of the Revolution, were brought uh, after the battle in 1775. Great little building that still miraculously is in East Belfast on Route 1, otherwise just encroached upon in every direction today by uh, commercialism. Uh, this is the um, Black Horse Tavern built for Jerome Stevenson in 1800. And we see it there with the old well sweep. And now we're back on Paris Hill uh, in the commercial uh, department. Uh, the Governor Albion K. Paris Law Office on Paris Hill of 1809. And here in the 30s, again, looking a little worse for wear, uh, needing a little repair on the porch and quite a bit of paint. Uh, this is a great building. Uh, when uh, uh, there was that recent uh, celebration on Paris Hill uh, two or three summers ago on that incredibly hot day that some of us remember, uh, I remember because I was speaking that day, um, this little building was open and it was, it was fascinating to see. Albion Keith Paris was uh, the third uh, governor of Maine, uh, served in the 1820s. He was also a senator. Um, he was a very important uh, legal and political figure uh, in Maine in the first half of the 19th century. In little buildings like this, there's almost no survival of this type of building. So it's quite wonderful that it's still with us today. Next, please. 
meeting houses. We started out with meeting houses, but we're now turning to meeting houses and churches. This is the oldest of the intact meeting houses in Maine, a Harpswell meeting house of 1759. Um, building which survived because when a church was built across the street in the 1840s, this was adapted to become the town office, and so it served for many years, and that's how it remained. And here's a view from the cemetery, and we're actually looking at the famous Elijah Kellogg Parish Church to the left in the background. That's the church that took everybody across the street out of the meeting house in the 1840s. But the meeting house has survived, and it's still preserved by the town and the historical society. <coughs> Next, please. We started our talk tonight with the drawing of the old German church in Walboro. Here's a photo of it from the 1930s, built in 1770-73. Uh, it was moved to its present location in 1795, and now is entirely surrounded by a large cemetery. One of the finest of the meeting houses from the 18th century is the Alder Meeting House near Wiscasset from 1789. Um, like the Harpswell Meeting House, this survived through adaptive reuse. It was eclipsed as a meeting house in the 1830s. People stopped using it because they moved up to the meeting house in head time. And so local farmers stored their hay here for several decades. And then in 1889, when the building became that magical 100-year-old uh, benchmark, the town rallied around the building, raised the money to restore it, and has preserved it carefully ever since. And it's very fortunate they did, because this has probably the greatest of the 18th century meeting house interiors to see. The full uh, pulpit, the sounding board, Everything's intact, the galleries, the pews. Um, it's, it's a beautiful interior. Um, a most unusual uh, early 19th century meeting house, by around 1800, we shifted from meeting houses to churches. But here, as late as 1818, 1819, over in Porter, was built um, a more traditional uh, meeting house form, particularly on the interior. This building was completed in 1824, very uh, austere exterior and a very interesting interior. Again, with the pulpit on the back wall, big window to light the pulpit, and the galleries around three sides oriented to the pulpit, the pews on the first story. Um, this has to be one of the last buildings in Maine to reflect the 18th century meeting house form. Beautiful building that is still very much with us today on Congress Street in Portland, mm -hmm. the first parish church of 1825-26, designed by John Muzzy, who was a member of the parish, built of local granite uh, in the federal style, an elegant both exterior and interior. And uh, my, here's a close-up of uh, taken from the Sonic Hall, looking back across uh, Portland from east to west. Uh, with a beautiful uh, belfry and spire. The Weber vane is from the old Jerusalem meeting house, originally built about 1740. The Weber vane dates from about 1760. Here is a delightful little school building that stands not far from the Alma meeting house, a little one-room schoolhouse from 1795, one of the earliest schoolhouses to survive in Maine. The Alden District School, a little square building with the bed belfry. The old academy in Wiscasset was built in 1807, used as a school until 1923, and has been a summer art gallery since 1958. This little granite schoolhouse from Bristol was built in 1835, and there are actually two or three of these little stone schools on the peninsulas uh, down in the bristol Pittsburgh uh, area. Uh, these are, are, are remarkable buildings, and, and they have survived. I mentioned early on the Pineville Courthouse, which was built a year before the Bowman House on the Kennebec River, both of them at uh, Dresden. 
And here we see it before the restoration of the Lincoln County Association when it acquired it in the 1950s. It was still a private home in the 30s when these photographs were taken. Huge three-story building, multi-purpose building. Uh, not only uh, was it a courthouse, it served as a tavern, as a hotel for people staying during the court sessions. Courtrooms were here. There was a family who lived here permanently. It was a multi-faceted building. It was built by Gershon Flagg, the architect builder who had also designed and built uh, the, the Bowman House near Bowman. He was from Boston. And this is the water side, or Kennebec River side, of uh, the Palmborough Courthouse. Uh, equally grand because much of the transportation was by the river. And actually, the staircase in both the Bowman House and the Pound Grove Courthouse were oriented toward the river rather than toward the land. People, the primary entrances were on the river. Uh, this, of course, is one of the oldest public buildings in Maine, uh, the old York Jail, a built uh, any, between 1719 in 1806, it was built in stages, has a great, great gamble roof. It's also the first building to be preserved and opened as a museum building in Maine. Uh, it was acquired by the York Historical Society about 1899 and opened to the public about 1900. It predates the opening of the Longfellow House in Portland by one year. Um, of course, in the days when it first opened as a museum, it had a big date 1653, painted on the side wall. Uh, and uh, there was indeed, as research shows, a jail uh, in York County built as early as that time, but not this building. Uh, however, when the late uh, Neil Allen Jr., who was a very fine colonial legal scholar, and Richard Candy, who was a very fine architectural historian, did extensive research in the original York County records on the construction of this building, documented that it was built in 1719 to 1806, and gave a talk uh, in York to explain that uh, to those who were interested. Uh, two ladies came up afterwards and said, yes, that's all well and good, but we like our date better. Yes. <laughs> so what can you do? <laughs> Next, please. Uh, here's another familiar landmark. Um, this is the Oxford County Jail, built in 1822 to 28. Uh, one of the early, uh, entirely granite uh, public buildings in Maine. Uh, of course, uh, the roof line has changed a couple times in the history of this building. Uh, it was originally a, a, a gable roof. Uh, then it became this very elaborate uh, overhang uh, with the little dome on it when it became the Hamlin Memorial Library uh, in 1900. And now, of course, it has yet another roof on it. Um, but it's, it's a great little building. Uh, and of course, there are many local treasures uh, kept there. Uh, here's a close-up photograph taken in the 30s of the uh, great granite construction uh, with, of course, the, uh, the metal enframements around the windows and the metal bars. Fort Western in Augusta uh, dates from 1754. And the same builder from Boston who worked on the Palmborough Courthouse and the Bowman House uh, also created this early fort. This building was built on the site of uh, the Kushnik Training Post of 1623 that was established by uh, members of the uh, Pilgrim Colony at Plymouth. This building uh, is the oldest uh, intact wooden fortification in America. Uh, this is the core building, uh, which is the barracks building and the multi-purpose building. Uh, if you go there today, you'll find two blockhouses that date from the restoration of the 1920s and two that date from a more recent restoration along with Palisade. But overall, it's a wonderful recreation and re-visualization of what was actually there. And the remarkable thing is that the core building is, is still intact. This was saved by the Gannett family in the 1920s and given to the, the city of Augusta. Here's an interior. Uh, this was already in the 20s. The, the building had been restored and was open to the public. And so we have uh, the 
quote unquote colonial kitchen uh, with what uh, one of my great mentors in the field, Abbott Lowell Cummings, would call the culinary obstacle course. <laughs> I don't think they ever had all those things out there all at once. But, but whenever you went into uh, museum houses when I was younger, uh, every last pot and pan was out on display. And uh, in the same period that the uh, Kennebec River Valley was being developed, of course, uh, one of the, um, the ways in which uh, the Kennebec Purchase Company advertised uh, the development of the area was to assure settlers that there was adequate protection against the French and Indians. So not only was Fort Western built, but also even further up the river, uh, Fort Halifax was built in the same year, 1754. Here, it was a case of a, of a Falmouth, now Portland builder, Isaac Ilsley, being involved. And one of the blockhouses survived into the 19th century and became preserved as early as the 1870s. This is the, that blockhouse at uh, Winslow, Fort Halifax, as we, was photographed in the 1930s. On the April Fool's 1987 flood, this building, after being there for well over 200 years, was <coughs> swept away down the river by the flood. And the Bureau of Parks and Lands, who was now responsible for it, made tremendous efforts to go literally from a few hundred feet to down into Casco Bay, all the way into Casco Bay, looking for parts of this building. And we were able to actually reassemble about 40% of the original building. And then the rest has been replicated. But the building is back up and on much uh, surer footings, I assure you. Here's another of the great uh, wooden uh, fortifications, Fort Edgecombe, an octagonal blockhouse dating from the War of 1812 period. This was built to protect the very active port of Wiscasset. Uh, from um, attack. Uh, this was sited at a very strategic location across from Wiscasset uh, at the uh, entrance to the Sheepskit River. Also in Wiscasset, from the War of 1812 period, 1813, uh, is the Powder House. And here we see another of these beautifully meticulous drawings done by one of the architects for the Historic American Building Survey, the 1813. Uh, powder house at Wiscasset. And we end with a very unique structure, uh, the Portland Observatory on the top of Montjoy Hill, uh, built in uh, 1807 by Captain Lemuel Moody. Many people think this is a lighthouse, but actually it was built as a signal tower. Uh, in the period in which Portland was such an active port, uh, the uh, merchants each had their own merchant flag on their vessel. Moody had copies of all of these flags, and he would spot your vessel as it was coming to the harbor, fly your flag, and you could get your wharf ready for the vessel coming in. It was also a place where the weather was kept, and it was a place which was considered part of the defense system of Portland, uh, watching out for, for attack, particularly in the War of 1812 period. This structure <coughs> stayed in the Moody family from 1807 until the 1930s. And it was at just at this time that uh, the Moody family turned it over to the city of Portland in the late 30s. And then the WPA, not only through the Historic and Building Survey did they record this building, but they also provided the money and the manpower to do the first restoration on the building. Uh, now, it was considerably less in cost than the more recent restoration that the city of Landmarks did at about $2 million. But uh, we're very fortunate that this unique structure, uh, there's not another one of these signal towers left on the Atlantic coast, is still very much a part of the Portland skyline today. You can still walk up the great wooden staircase and go to the top, uh, 82 feet above Montjoy Hill. I even have friends who have been married at the top of the observatory. <laughs> uh, you can do that. And, they, and on July 4th, they auction off the, uh, the cupola uh, for sightings for, for fireworks. Uh, but it's a great landmark, and this is, as it appeared, May the 30, shortly before the Restoration. So I think you can see from this very rapid selection of both drawings and photographs from the Historic American Building Survey, as carried out in Maine uh, in 
particularly the 1936-37 period, but overall from 33 to 41. Um, what an important record this constitutes for Maine, and if you magnify this across the country, think every state. I know, for example, many years ago when I was first getting interested in this, um, there was a very distinctive uh, Russian-style church in Alaska that burned, and totally burned. And yet, fortunately, in the 1930s, someone had gone up there and photographed it and done meticulous line drawings of it, so it was able to be accurately recreated. And while you don't always necessarily want to replicate buildings, there are times when you do. Uh, and this is, was one of those times. So the Historic American Building Survey has certainly proven its value. And it's interesting when we reflect upon the situation that we are currently in, uh, the Great Recession of 2008-2009, uh, uh, what they might have called in the 19th century uh, a panic, uh, the Panic of 1837. Um, the stimulus ideas of the New Deal, some of those we're thinking about today, this was one of the really successful programs that gave us uh, a wonderful record of our built environment and our architectural heritage. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, um, uh, 
installations. And I think probably some of that begins to be published in books and even in magazine plates mm -hmm. at, that, at that time. Uh, that makes sense. I, I, I think that this, that he developed that probably in the 1790s. Yes. Uh, there. He did it, uh, his lady brother, Lady Palmerston, uh, uh, complained about smoke in her bedroom. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he solved, solved the problem, and solved the problem for all of London, right, at the, at, 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 at the same time. And I'm, I'm going to say, in the, in the, uh, some, somewhere in the 1790s, he was uh, back in England. That makes sense. And then I think probably it was spread very quickly by, by publications, probably. Yeah. Questions? Why don't we stop and take a break and have us some refreshments and uh, okay. then you, yeah. you'll have to go uh, directly. So thank you again, Ron. Thank you.